Um, as for the issue definitions, this is not going to be as useful. This is just a list of all of the specific issues that can happen with Burp Suite. Now we move over to the proxy tab and this is also a really cool option here. I spent most of my time I would say um, here we have again the same filter options so you can show only in scope items, hide items without responses, show only parameterized requests, really useful request type filters if you ask me. You can see that one thing has gone from here which is the filter by empty folders. That's because there are no folders in the HTTP history of course. Um, and then we also have an extra option here, filter by listener, and that's because we can have multiple proxy listeners, of course, and they are all going to be listening on different ports, and we can filter on those specific ports as well. Now, one thing I forgot to mention is you can see the show only commented items and show only high highlighted items in here. If we have a specific response that we want to look at later on, we can highlight that. We can right click that resp response, and then we have an option for highlighting a response in a specific color. Now, if we do that, then we can filter on those specific responses. We can group specific responses if we want to, like we can color all of these in red. Um, and I want to color all of these in a different color because they might be from a different user or something like that. And we can also add a comment to a specific URL like this test. And then if we do that, it's going to add that to the list here. Now we can filter on those, but we can also, of course, put the comments on top. And then we have that list as well. I usually filter by putting my, le my latest one up here. Um, that's going to make sure that I don't have to keep scrolling down, down, down. I just filter with the latest number at the top. And then again, you can also highlight by just clicking the number and it's going to highlight the whole row for you. So those are some tricks for the intercept for the HTTP history. Um, here we have the request, we have a response, very simple stuff. We can right click that, we can do things in here. Um, but we'll get more into those context menus later. Now for the intercept tab, by default, Burp is going to start with intercept on. If you're surfing to a website but nothing is loading, check if intercept is on. That happened to me way more than I like to admit, so check if it's on, that's going to help you a lot. Then of course, Burp also has a built-in browser which you can use, which I almost never use because again, I want to save time and I have my passwords saved in my browser's password manager. What this is going to do is start a completely new session. So you're going to lose all of those passwords every, day, every single time. I just used Firefox for that, by the way. Um, then we also have the WebSocket history and this is pretty cool. Uh, WebSocket is pretty much an advanced HTTP protocol. You can see it is that. Now I know that I'm butchering it. Please don't, don't kill me for that. Um, but we can also send this stuff to repeater, do the same things in here. We also have a filter in here, which we again can filter by port listener. But we don't have a lot of the stuff here, like you can see in here. We cannot filter by search term. We cannot filter by file extension because that's just not applicable. Uh, it's going to be a lot harder to, oh, sorry, we can filter by search term. We're missing this MIME type option. And that's because MIME types, of course, are not applicable to WebSockets. Now, what a WebSocket is going to do is make a connection to the client or to the server, and it's going to exchange messages that way. Um, we used to not have this option in the burp when I started. It was all make your own WebSocket stuff, but now I'm really, really glad that we do have it in here. It's going to make our lives a lot easier. Um, for the proxy options, this is something that is going to be really cool. This is my favorite part of Burp because it has some really cool options in here. Again, you can add, edit or remove certain, certain listeners. Now, why would you want to do that? You might be asking. Imagine this scenario. So you're testing and you're testing with real devices. Um, maybe you're testing with five mobile applications, like you're testing with five mobile phones and all of those different phones, you can set them to a different listener and then you can capture all of their traffic on that different listener. If you then later on need to filter for one specific phone, you can filter for one specific listener. You have many scenarios that I can think of which 
multiple listeners would be useful for. So definitely try it out and see if you can find some scenarios for yourself. You also have the import export CA certificate and regenerate CA certificate. Those are needed for capturing your traffic and being able to read it. So you need this certificate um, for your man in the middle proxy. And then you have the intercept and the Cli the intercept client request sorry about that this one is not as interesting for me this one i don't use as much so i'm going to skip it as well the intercept service response server responses same thing uh, if you really want to and you don't want to capture specific requests like for example if you don't want to get put requests you can say i want to does not match the put request in here so I can edit this one, not add a new one. I can say HTTP method does not match get post or put, or I can just keep it at put. I can just make it get. Uh, I can add several rules in here, which are going to add to allow me to remove certain requests from my proxy. Can be very useful. For example, like you see in here, we have these polling calls in here. Say I don't want to capture them. Then I can say a new rule and the body does not, let's see, body does not match. And then I can say star, like I can say specific things in here. So that's useful in some scenarios. It's not as useful for me. Uh, for me, it becomes very useful at this response modification section. This is where the most important things are for me because I usually try to unhide hidden form fields and I prominently online, uh, highlight them. That's going to draw a big red square around your form field and it's going to be very useful in my opinion because hidden form fields, they're hidden for a reason. Then you can enable those disabled form fields as well. Sometimes you just want to type in a form field but it's disabled, you have to go into inspect element. You have to remove that disabled thingy. It's really annoying. I don't care about any front end protection that's client aimed like this. Um, I do care about the JavaScript and object tags. I do care about the HTTP thingy. I do care about that secure flag. Those things are not things that I am going to be able to manipulate as an attacker to gain an advantage really easily. But these things I am able to manipulate really easily like the input field length limits. That's something that's really annoying. Sometimes if length limit is just front end and your API isn't going to care if you send it one character or a million characters. So I just remove all of that front end stuff and also any JavaScript form validation that is available. Um, it's useful of course to have and it's useful to be there, but it's not going to protect the web server. The web server needs to be protected at a web server level. It's as simple as that. Now for your match and replace, there's some seriously cool things we can do with this. Match and replace in here, we can do things like test for CSRF. If we want to test CSRF tokens, we can replace them from the body automatically, like say this. So for example, CSRF equals Got it typed right, of course, CSRF equals star. If we want to replace every single CSRF token with a one, we can automatically do that from the request body. There we go. If you're now clicking around on the website, we're automatically testing for CSRF. There's IDORs that you can test with this. There's even cross-site scripting, like replacing every input that you have. Like if you have one specific input factor, for example, my input factor for cross-site scripting might be this. Um, I might always for cross-site scripting have an image source equal x on error uh, equals alert and then I might add in some other things as well uh, like for example a single um, a double one uh, and then maybe some like this to get I don't know just test everything at once you know um, but I don't want to type this every time and I don't want to keep this in my clipboard either because there are other things that I have to paste in my clipboard as well I can say for example match everywhere that I type five times a and replace it with my attack factor that way if I am testing of course I have to sometimes do regex match not in this case i think because it's a little replacement and i need to do that in the request body there we go now every time that i type five a's and i've sent my re request in uh, it's going to replace that with my attack factor and i don't have to worry about it anymore 
it's going to be very quick for me. Uh, I love doing stuff like this. It, it saves me a couple of nanoseconds, but all of those nanoseconds add up. The rest of those I don't really touch. I leave them alone. You can add a TLS pass through. You can do some of this miscellaneous stuff, but that's not really important in my opinion.